All right, let me show you something cool here. Here is a chart of the Harley Davidson stock price and each of these bars is a week. So in the last few weeks, you can see starting in October, Harley Davidson has had a pretty good run all the way down from a wick of $25 to currently sitting on $43. Very impressive stock performance. Any company would be very, very happy with that. You have to admit, Harley Davidson is doing a great job until you zoom out. And when you zoom out, you can see, hmm, not quite as impressive as initially thought, was it? Because Harley Davidson in 2014 topped out at $74. And if you go further back in 2006, topped out at $76. In fact, the reason I drew this blue line across is because I wanted to show you that Harley Davidson had a stock price of $43 all the way back in 2000. That's right, the year 2000. Now in 2000, those $43 bought a lot more than $43 buys today. In fact, if you look over here, you will notice that in terms of consumables, your dollar bought you twice as much as it buys you right now. In terms of actual assets, like houses and things like that, it buys you way more than twice as much, probably four or five times as much. So this stock price, which has not had a split since the year 2000, so this is the same 43 bucks, is actually very unimpressive. And if you look at the stock performance from 2014 to today, it's in this kind of descending little wedge down. It's coming down and it's coming down. It's been coming down for years. Here is a chart of the S&P 500, the 500 biggest US companies in that same amount of time. So as you can see, Harley Davidson's performance is rather pathetic compared to the rest of the stock market. So in essence, Harley Davidson as a company is losing value over the decades. And that is despite the fact that it has had a habit of artificially inflating its value by buying back its stock with its profits and creating fake demand to raise its stock price. And despite all of this, and the fact that the rest of the stock market has been ripping up since 2014, Harley's stock is on a steady decline. Now if you're an investor and you look at this dumpster fire of a chart, are you keen on putting your money in this thing? Yeah, neither am I. So, in this video, we'll explore the reasons why this is happening. Hint, mismanagement at the top. And compare this to another classic motorcycle company, Royal Enfield, which has been managed very differently and which is poised to take over the world of retro motorcycling as it approaches a million sales of legit large motorcycles in a year. What is Siddharth Lal, the dynamic leader of Iker Motors, and by extension Royal Enfield, doing that Harley CEO Johann Zeist is failing to do? Stay tuned! And as always, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing and if you're enjoying the content, help us out by liking the video and sharing it with friends. First, let's face it. Harley sales have fallen by half in the last 10 years because a lot of the models that were accessible to people on a normal budget have been cut. The Dynas, air-cooled sportsters, streets, electric glide standards, sport glide, road king 107 and so on and so forth are either gone from the lineup or replaced by much more pricey models. It's as if Harley doesn't want you to have the choice of a less expensive bike. No road king or sport glide for you. It's the road king special and lowrider ST or nothing. So fewer affordable models is one reason for dropping sales but with only the more expensive bikes remaining, the customer base is shrinking too. There are only so many people who can afford these bikes, although there are plenty who can't afford them and buy them anyways. That's a topic for another video. And most of the folks who can afford them are boomers, the richest generation in history. Honestly, look it up. Boomers hold 70% of the household wealth in the US. And boomers are getting older and may not buy another bike. Just keep what they have or downsize. Now Harley CEO Johann Zeist has been very vocal about trying to turn Harley Davidson into a premium brand, which explains the purge of less expensive bikes from the lineup. And this is a strategy that, in the short term, has raised profits and the stock price, though most of the stock market has been on a tear since the beginning of 2023. Yep, downsizing, read, firing a bunch of American workers, is one way to cut costs. 
At the same time, increasing margins on more expensive models, read gouging your customers more, also raises profits. But at what cost? Does anybody actually think that Harley Davidson has any chance of increasing sales and market share in the near or distant future? Or is this just the last money grab as the company shrinks and fades into irrelevance? Labeling your company a premium brand is actually a devastating admission that you cannot compete on merit and have to rely on your iconic name and brand recognition to wring the last few cents out of your aging customers' pockets before they stop buying motorcycles and your sales drop below those of Triumph and Gasp, maybe even Indian. Has Harley admitted that they can't compete? May as well have. There was supposed to be a Bronx, but the fact that the company pulled it indicates that they knew very well that it couldn't hang with other naked bikes on performance or price. There was supposed to be a Pan America 975, but it's been pulled or delayed because it would have just been the Pan America 1250 with a 975 engine. All the same weight with two thirds of the power. The adventure bike crowd would not have given that bike a second look with motorcycles like the KTM 890 Adventure and Ducati Desert X around. But decades spent on doubling down on cruisers has only resulted in some pretty nice but overpriced cruisers. And one pretty nice adventure bike and not much else. Harley still doesn't know how to build an entry level bike. Maybe some of the money used for stock buybacks could have been better spent on R&D. So is this the wrong strategy? It's wrong if you care about the long term health of the brand, but it is perfectly logical if you want to maximize your earnings in the short term. A conspiracy theorist might even say that it's smart if you want to sell the company for a high price to some big conglomerate that would add it to its other holdings. But I didn't say that. But is there another way to conduct business, one that comes not from a scarcity mindset but from a growth mindset? Well here's where we get to Siddharth Lal, the former CEO and current managing director of Iker Motors, the parent company of Royal Enfield. Siddharth is an actual automotive engineer who became CEO of Royal Enfield in 2000, at the age of 26. He then proceeded to build new factories, hire international design teams, expand some of the company's R&D to England, introduce a plethora of new engines and models, and increase the company's sales from about 100,000 units in 2012 to over 900,000 in 2023. And those are relatively large motorcycles, not 50cc scooters and mopeds they're selling. It is very possible that either in 2024 or 25, Royal Enfield will sell 1 million motorcycles, making it bigger than Harley Davidson, Triumph, Ducati, BMW and KTM combined. The company's bikes, while clearly retro and uncomplicated, are affordable, cool and very appealing to a younger demographic, a group of people who will stay with the brand for the long run. Additionally, although most of the sales are still concentrated in India, Royal Enfield is making a huge push out into the UK, Europe and North America, and riders are noticing. Ten years ago, Royal Enfields were a curiosity where I live. A niche brand of old tech bikes with a limited dealership network and a dubious reputation for reliability. Now they are modern and desirable with reliable motors while retaining their retro cool design. And this is what I mean by growth mindset. It would have been easy for Royal Enfield to keep on building the same old model forever and relying exclusively on their heritage and domestic sales, but when you have a dynamic CEO who is an enthusiast, who participates in the design of the bikes as well as the adventures of launching them, you chart a different course. And yes, Royal Enfield has the innate advantage of a less expensive domestic workforce as well as the largest domestic market on the planet, but they have zero desire to stay in that market exclusively. They are in the conquest business, as evidenced by the opening of their new American headquarters in Milwaukee, just down the street from Harley Davidson. So despite the fact that both companies produce retro motorcycles, the contrast between them couldn't be more obvious. Royal Enfield is growing and innovating at an incredible rate and introducing a couple of new models every year, while Harley Davidson is laying off staff while charging more for a decreasing number of models in order to maintain the illusion of growth. So for the time being, after some dicey years, the fire is out at Harley-Davidson, though each year they sell fewer and fewer motorcycles. And because the United States is crisscrossed with interstate highways, Harley can sell huge and expensive motorcycles to an ever-shrinking customer base because those bikes ride well on fast roads. But there are only so many people who want to pay big bucks for cruisers, and those who want to pay small bucks for them, or for British retros, will go to Royal Enfield. 
Sport riders will go to Ducati or the Japanese brands. A few adventure riders may opt for the Pan America, which is admittedly competitive in its segment, but most will opt for BMW, KTM and Yamaha. And other than adventure bikes, Harley has not made a move to compete in any of the other categories. And that spells trouble for the future. R&D and expansion into new niches is a crucial part of survival. If you're not growing, you're shrinking. I mean, Ducati and Triumph are building dirt bikes now. They know the deal. So am I saying Harley Davidson is going to die? No, I've never said that. There will always be people with money who are willing to pay for a nice looking and sounding cruiser. However, as time passes, there will be fewer of those folks around. And if Harley Davidson does not want to recede into irrelevance, they will have to change and compete on more than just name recognition and heritage. If you want an actual prediction of the future, here it is. In the next two years, Royal Enfield will sell a million bikes in a calendar year. In the next decade, Triumph, a company that has bothered to produce adventure, sport and naked motorcycles and is now moving into dirt bikes and entry-level machines, built in India by the way, will sell more units than Harley. And finally, a decade from now, Indian will be close to Harley in units sold and the amount of dealerships both around the world and in North America. Now, when I started this channel five years ago, all of those statements would have seemed ridiculous, but nobody's laughing now. Fact is, I'll probably buy me a Harley or maybe an Indian as a retirement present in the next five to seven years. I like those bikes a lot. I just don't like how Harley Davidson is managed and tend to be fairly vocal about it precisely because I hope it survives and thrives. Don't mistake this video for saltiness or hatred of the company. It's just tough love, that's all. But what do you think? Are my criticisms fair? Does Johann Zeist even have a choice or is he caught between changing demographics, increasing labor costs, a stubborn customer base and increasing competition? Are you lining up to buy hog stock in this bull run? I'd love to hear your opinion on these topics, so please leave them in the comments below. I hope you're enjoying the spring so far and revving up for a great riding season. And as always, ride safe, thanks for watching and may the spokes be with you. It's the sort of Bruce Lee effect, as I call it, right? Because till Bruce Lee came around, you know, from a fighter's perspective, a bigger chap with more muscles was always going to win, right? And was always stronger, right? But then Bruce Lee came along and changed the paradigm entirely.